I've invented something. It's called the YouTube Channel of Truth Paradox. It states without exception that if a channel has the word truth in its name, then you can guarantee that the contents of said channel is a load of old cobblers. Do a search now. You'll see. Hello everybody, my name is Simon Dan and we are back for another episode of the second best show on YouTube, Tin Fall Tuesday. So in an effort to show how the paradox works, today we're going to be looking at a channel called... That's right, Truth Speaks is getting the Simon Dan treatment today. Let's see what his video is about. Hey, is evolution a hoax? Paradox confirmed. You know, when I became an atheist, I began to watch the debates between atheists and Christians, and evolution kept coming up as a reason to why God didn't exist, was because we have evolution. And that really puzzled me, because before I was an atheist, I was an agnostic. Bloody hell, some of these people changed their stance on religion more times than Cadbury's changed the price of a Freddo. Little one for the UK millennials there. And the reason I became an atheist was really because of the problem of evil. It wasn't because of evolution. When it came to evolution, I thought that, well, if God doesn't exist, well, maybe evolution is how things came about. But if he does exist, then he could have just as easily created a process to create organisms. This is a fair point. Evolution itself doesn't directly disprove a creator. However, Many religious people doubt evolution is a thing, and I'm guessing this is what you're going to eventually move on to. Well, I think we can see that just if we make the analogy of a factory that creates cars. You can have a process of a factory and that can create a car, but just because you have a process does not eliminate the fact that you have someone that designed the factory. I didn't really get why atheists or using evolution as one of the main points to say that God didn't exist. Atheists don't ever use that as an argument that God doesn't exist. We usually defend evolution as being true, not use it to go on the offensive. So when these statements kept getting raised in these debates, that really put it upon me to go and check out evolution. And I'm going to link up an article that's going to be linked in the bottom of this video that comes from PBS and it talks about the evolution of the whale. And in that article, there's a lot of language that is used that is very telling. To start off, the story of the evolution of the whale goes something like this. It started off as a smaller, land-dwelling creature, and then evolved into the seagoing whale that we now see today. Is there any other type of whale other than a seagoing whale? The beginnings of a whale supposedly started with a creature called Pachycetus. And let's take a look at a picture of Pachycetus. Now let's take a look at the modern day whale. Let's take a look at that one more time. Does anyone recognize a problem there? Do you see the differences just in appearance of those two creatures? Yes, I can see a difference in appearance. What's your point? One is a species alive today, and the other lived around 50 million years ago. Now, you did have some credibility at the start of this video, but then you laugh like that and your ignorance slapped me in the face like a wet fish. Let me ask you a question. Would you laugh at the difference between a Pachycetus and this animal? Probably not, right? Well, they both share a common ancestor, so why would you, hey? Okay, what about these two animals? This is an Ambulocetus from the last picture with a Cuchocetus. No, I wouldn't laugh at that either. They look quite similar. Let's try again. 
What about the Cuchicetus from before and this, a Rhodocetus? Hmm, yeah, I don't think that's funny. Rhodocetus and a Duridon? Dorodon and a whale? Wait, would you look at that? It's almost as if you need a succession of transitional species to get from an animal in the past to one that's alive now, like how evolutionists explain it. Wow. Um, I'm gonna start off with a little quote from that article. And it says, some details remain fuzzy and under investigation. But we know for certain that this back-to-the-water evolution did occur, thanks to a profusion of intermediate fossils that have been uncovered over the past two decades. Hmm, profusion. Well, when it comes to this profusion of intermediate fossils, this large amount of fossils that we have, you know, this very big transition sequence, here is the transition sequence of the whale. Oh, bless him, he thinks we've just found one of each fossil. Just as an example, if we look at the Pacacetus that you first mentioned earlier, we found four different species of that alone. There's a problem with that, and the questions that lead to that big problem are actually very simple. To start, what led to the creation of the land-dwelling creature? The evolution of sea-dwelling creatures. You know, this is a common thing within evolution, that you start at a fully formed creature and then evolve to another creature. But that's really not how things are supposed to have started. Indeed they aren't. Evolution never starts at one creature and ends up with another. It's a continuous process that will never have a finished article. It ebbs and flows through time, moulding the species of this planet. You either survive as a species, or you don't. So another question is, why did this land-dwelling creature change into a whale? Do we know? Or are we just taking a guess? You really have no clue, do you? The skull of Pacacetus shows a thick bony wall surrounding the ear region. This is not seen in any, any other mammal other than, you've guessed it, whales. The fossils of Amblycetus were found in sediments that comprised of an ancient estuary, which suggests a semi-aquatic life. This is further supported by the ratio of oxygen isotopes found in the fossils, showing an equal amount of ingestion of both salt and fresh water. Whales that evolved after Amblycetus showed even higher levels of salt water oxygen isotopes. Looking through the transitional species, you can see that the nostrils have migrated back to what is now a whale's blowhole. Let's not forget whales are mammals, not fish. They'd already lost the ability to breathe in water. But the true icing on the cake is the almost complete loss of the hind limbs and pelvis. Because whales evolved from walking land animals, their backbone moved up and down, not side to side like a fish. This meant they no longer required their hind limbs and pelvis. If you take a look at the transitional species, you can clearly see the shrinking of those limbs over time. We even occasionally find living whales today with the vestiges of tiny hind limbs inside its body walls. So no, we didn't guess. Another good question to ask is how did any transitional form of the species survive by procreation in this whole process? It seems that that would become very difficult, especially in the transitional stages. Is anyone asking that question? No, no one's ever asked that question because it's a stupid one. You're genuinely asking how is it that these animals could have sex? Another good question to ask is how do we take into account the complete reformation of the outside structure of a creature? And also factoring in that the complete inner workings of the creature have to be completely overhauled and changed. I think you, like almost all who oppose it, are misunderstanding how evolution works. You don't have one animal that gives birth to a completely different animal. The change is a slow, gradual one. Imagine you are stood at the base of Mount Everest. Let's say that you, at the base, represent the skin of our Pacacetus from the start. Now let's say you want to climb Mount Everest and the peak represents the skin of a modern day whale. 
What if you make one step every day? That'd be easy, right? It wouldn't take, it would, it would take ages, but you could do that, yeah? A quick bit of rough maths would tell us that at this rate, it would take you about 80 years to make it to the top. It's kind of like your whole life. That's still way quicker than evolution. You know, evolution, especially if you go to like a natural history museum, a lot of times you're going to see bones. You know, bones going from this to this to this to this. The problem is, is that the bones are not really the problem. Um, I think I get what you're saying there. Do you know how complicated the digestive system is? The circulatory system? The nervous system? How are these things changing? Extremely gradually over a huge amount of time. If you start out with a land-dwelling creature, these things have to be completely re -strung. You have to get the brain from one point to another point. The nose has to go to the top of the head from the front. How does that happen? I've shown you already. Listen, man. The skin has to become waterproof. Oh no, the water is seeping into my skin. I can feel it. Oh man, it's touching my bones. Oh wait, hang on, I'm fine. The whale then has to have a diving apparatus too. How does that happen? All of these interchanges have to happen. You know, there are many, many, many systems that are at work within a organism and they all have to be changed and rerouted. You are right, some of them do have to be changed and rerouted, but sometimes evolution fucks up. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is a nerve that, put simply, connects the brain and the larynx. Why then does it go all the way down to the chest, wrap underneath the aortic arch, and then go back up again, when it's merely only a few centimetres away? The reason is because of the development of the circulatory system of our fish-like ancestors. When the neck started to elongate and the heart began to lower into the chest, the nerve became caught on the wrong side of the heart. Imagine what, what that's like for the poor old giraffe. As Richard Dawkins once eloquently said, evolution cannot go back to the drawing board. Another question that no one asks is that when we have a change, an evolutionary change happen, doesn't that affect the entire ecosystem, the entire food chain? You know, if one creature is evolving, the entire ecosystem, the entire food chain, needs to be rapidly evolving to handle this. Everything has to be evolving if one thing is going to switch out of one capacity and take another. So how is the food chain able to be keeping intact and not collapsing on itself when one creature just decides to evolve. I get it now. Your brain just can't handle the huge timescales it takes for evolution to occur. All of your arguments revolve around this. It's not your fault. You're human. It's tough to imagine. I know. These questions are never raised. Why aren't they raised? When you're so sure, so for certain that something did happen, and yet so many unanswered questions remain. Well, I've just answered all your questions, so we should be good. Yes? I think the biggest uh, kicker for this article happens at the end. Um, and it says, as evolutionary biologist Neil Shubin points out, quotations, in one sense, evolution didn't invent anything new with whales. It was just tinkering with land mammals. It's using the old to make the new. No. No, no, no. 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 Yes, 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 yes. Yes. See how easy that is to do? Dear, oh dear. I think even I have taken all that I can from this guy. He rambles on for about another eight minutes or so, producing flaky analogy after flaky analogy. Then, wraps it all up with some biblical readings. So if you want to check out the rest of his video, Please do, but remember, play nice. Right, that about wraps it up for another Tinfoil Tuesday. Thank you all for joining me. Evolution is a favourite topic of mine, so expect to see more of it soon. Please, please do like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. That means you too, Sarah Crooks, sat at work with your headphones in, all by yourself. 
and I will see you all on Friday where the biggest flat earther channel on YouTube gets some. See you then. Bye.